Hi, I'm Patrick Rosencrantz. I'm the author of Rebel Visions, The Underground Comics Revolution. Over the years, I've accumulated uh, some really thorough files on the underground cartoonists. Correspondence and uh, notes and photographs and sketches and interviews and articles. I've got all my comic books alphabetized from Amazon to zero zero. I've collected as much information as I can about this subject. This book, Rebel Visions, is the culmination of all my research and thinking and writing about underground comics. 1958, I was a student at the University of Texas and started working for a student humor magazine there, Texas Ranger. I was supposed to be studying history, but in fact the humor magazine was my main course of study. And that's all I've ever done the rest of my life. I lived in Los Angeles for a while. I did Wonder Warthog comics for drag cartoons, and then we did a couple of numbers of Wonder Warthog Quarterly. I first met Robert Crumb in New York in 1969. That, that was the days of the Gothic Blimp Works and the East Village Other, and I was doing pages once a week. What was it like to peddle your first Zap comics on the street corners of San Francisco? Oh, it was a lot of fun. It was really a gas, a real blast. And we were only charging a quarter, so it was no big deal. Hoping that enough people would like it so that I could somehow get to the point of earning a living doing it, I suppose, doing comics. What made it so popular in those days was that it spoke for a lot of people's visions that they had inside their head about life they would see things as these cartoons kind of fitted that vision so it, it caught a lot of people's imagination. One of the last posters I did was in the form of a comic strip. Uh, I did the poster so that it looked like a front page of Sunday Funnies. And then Robert Crumb had seen my family dog comic strip poster on Hay Street and found out how to get in touch with me. And I, I came home one day and there was Crumb was sitting on my front porch. He said he was going to uh, publish his app as a periodical and he wanted me to come on board and join up and, and ask if I knew of any other artists that were working in a cartoon format. That's how Victor and I wound up in the comics. Posters were over. Comics hadn't emerged yet because Zap was really the forerunner. Well, I read The East Village Other when I was a student at Columbia in New York and I loved the Sunshine Girl and Trash Man and Mr. Natural and I was hooked and I wanted to see more. It was a, the perfect vehicle for, for, for you know, early, uh, an early cartoonist. I mean, it really suited my purposes as well because I could do, you know, whatever I wanted and get paid for it, you know, which was impossible in, in the straight comic thing at the time. Comics really helped to sell newspapers. I mean, there's, there's no getting around that some people just will buy a newspaper just to see a comic strip. And I mean, uh, the, the strips that we were doing really, you know, like, uh, helped the circulation of evil. The underground cartoonist changed comics forever, made comics a, a medium for adults again. You know, the, the thing that really sums it up is those little dirty comic books. So little dirty comics, the underground comics, for the first time artists would put their name on photography. Everything up to then had been a, a form of uh, entertainment for a, a liberal, advanced, abstract audience. But when you, we got into those things, we were going for the juggler thing. We were just seeing how absurdly uh, improper can you get before uh, the authorities have to hunt you down. You know, and now you look at it and it's nothing. It's nothing now, you know? The boy in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, that stuff was just really hot potato. You know, you just didn't show those to everybody. The covers were done before the story. In fact, both the front and back covers are modifications of tarot cards. The front is strength. The woman opening a lion's mouth, both quieting it and urging it to speak, calming it down, civilizing it. And on the back cover, the boogeyman is actually the Virgin Mary unmasked, at least my version of it. I had a demonic vision of her that stem from my demonic vision of woman. I don't think I could have 
done the book have gotten the strength to break some of the taboos unless I had seen the cover repeatedly throughout that six month period assuring me that it was all uh, therapy, that it was all conscious effort to get at the root of some of these problems. The damn underground papers were just oppressive in the way they treated people a lot of the time. Politicos and women finally got to be the death of the underground. The politicos because they just blew any credibility, you know, they just, just lie and, you know, make up stories and began nitpicking cartoons and some, God, you know, if they were the revolution, forget it, you know. I don't know, I'd take Nixon over them, but I'd certainly take Lyndon Johnson over them, you know. <laughs> but I still wanted an outlet for the cartoons. So I just, uh, every week I'd just show up and just, uh, hand them this cartoon and uh, say, here's my cartoon, gotta go, you know. I got turned on to the old DC comics by Gary Arlington. He gave me a pile of them, about 25 of them. So then I wanted to get some more, you know, so I would go and read the EC comics from off the wall. And they were really off the wall. Gary had this great idea for a horror book, you know, and he had the title. So he had this great piece of paper that had skull written on the top in ballpoint pen, and I had a little square where the picture was supposed to go. I just instantly had this vision looking at this paper of the first uh, cover of the first skull. Hmm. So I rushed right home and drew it, and took it back to Gary Arlington, and he said, oh boy. And <laughs> then I rushed home and did this story. And Gary was the force, you know? Gary was the big power. I was one of the five founders of the Bugle back in middle of 1970. My uh, four partners were all journalists whose dream was to have their own paper. One of the things that I wanted to do right from the beginning was to have a page of comic strips. Uh, in a sense, a parody of the straight newspapers, comic pages. Also, it was a great artistic discipline to turn out a strip every week on schedule because it was a chance uh, to see your work in print a day or two after it was done, where a comic book often took months to get together and get printed. Mike Jacoby, the business manager, promised us a token $5 per strip, but even that was never paid because the paper just couldn't do it. Also, we started a thing called the Krupp Syndicate. It was an attempt to reproduce those strips and sell them to university papers, but we never really got enough papers to uh, cover much more than our costs, and uh, we ended up giving away most of them to underground papers. Hey, working in a vacuum, working in the, the mud cell, who's out there? And I don't know. It's kind of therapeutic. I mean, you got to do something, right? <laughs> you can't just sit around, you know, I'm too twitchy and nervous for that. i got to do something, you know. I think about it, like, how have I progressed? I look at my stuff, it's depressing, blah, 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 quack, 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 whatever. I'm a little blue-collar work ethic, you know. It's my job, period, you know. Publish your parish, deadlines your bedline. Shit or get off the pot, you know? If you want to join, if you want to be out the real gutter, quit fucking drawing. It's what separates me from the ape. Blah, 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 blah. So there's, like, there's an angel on one shoulder, a devil on the other. One's condemning, one's condoning. So which voice do you listen to? That's enough to make you schizophrenic, right? <laughs> I think that we were so outrageous that we expanded the boundaries of what you can do, of how much you can get away with, as it were. And remember, this was all done under Nixon and Reagan, for Christ's sake. It's amazing we didn't get thrown in jail. The fact that I was getting to do stories out of my own head that I wanted to do and didn't have people telling me what to do, I mean, hey, man, that's, that's the type of freedom that you can't argue with. Now, young foolish people that want to go into the medium have virtually, they can do anything they want. So to me, the legacy is unlimited boundaries, you know because an artist now can do virtually anything. And so now we're going to uh, say goodbye and hope you had a good time watching us all. And uh, we'll be back. Underground comics have influenced media in so many ways. Television, movies, other books. If it weren't for the underground comics movement, there wouldn't be the alternative comics, the graphic novels. There wouldn't be the loosening of taboos on television and other media. So they were one of the most important art movements of the 20th century. Mm -hmm.